Hello again. Um, Professor Raven Hansen's uh, last comments that the federal system in the United States has uh, been the least dysfunctional of any of our branches of government um, and has been the one branch in government that the public has relied upon for 200 years for integrity and honesty and, and making the right decision. Uh, and this is the best lead in to the Honorable Michael McKayze who's up here with me and who'll be speaking to you. Uh, very briefly, uh, I've known uh, Mike Bucasey since, uh, it's been about 44 years when we were assistant U.S. attorneys in the Southern District of New York at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, he has been uh, a member of the United States District Court, was appointed as a federal judge, um, and uh, uh, he then became chief judge of the Southern District of New York and while I went to become a poor country lawyer uh, in Midtown Manhattan, Michael went ahead to become the Attorney General of the United States in the Bush administration, the second 43. Um, he is uh, brilliant, he is honest, he is bright, uh, and uh, I think you all will be delighted to hear what he has to say. So I introduce Michael Mukasey. I, could, I, had, I had in my notes for that generous, make that lavish introduction. Um, although um, you may not like what I have to say, um, but I suppose the crowd has thinned out somewhat to the, the really, hearty, uh, really hearty citizens. Um, before I get to the prepared remarks, um, I feel the need um, to uh, dispel a couple of impressions that I think were created this morning. Um, and in particular relating to two topics, uh, one having to do with what I regard as the promiscuous use of the word torture um, to apply to the CIA interrogation program, um, the second having to do with detention and, and sort of conflating uh, Abu Ghraib and, and Guantanamo and sort of rolling it up in one ball of wax. Um, first, with regard to um, torture, um, you didn't hear any definition of torture. Um, torture is defined in the United States Code. It's a crime. Um, torture means one thing. It means subjecting somebody under color of law to severe physical or mental pain or suffering. That's the term. Severe physical mental or mental pain or suffering. Not just pain or suffering, severe. Um, severe physical pain or suffering isn't defined. Severe mental pain or suffering is, and it's defined in durational terms to mean it has to be something more than transitory. Um, I will tell you based on that and based on the memos that you can read that were, I think, intemperately released um, so as to terminate our uh, classified interrogation program that none of what was done by the CIA, including the most harsh interrogation techniques, amounted to torture. Um, in fact, the most celebrated of the harsh interrogation techniques, waterboarding, is used regularly to train SEALs and Army Rangers to resist interrogation. Um, I would go into detail, except that I don't want to use up the, 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 the most of my remarks. Um, that, that technique was used on three people, folks. Count them, three. Abu Zubaydah, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and Abdul Rahim al-Nashiri. And we got a ton of information from all three. In fact, Abdul, uh, Abu Zubaydah, the first person on whom these techniques were used, said, quote, do this for all the brothers, because he was, what he, what he disclosed was that they were religiously obligated to resist until they couldn't resist anymore. But once they couldn't resist, they were free to talk, and talk they did, and they disclosed an enormous amount of valuable information that in fact did stop um, many plots that were then in progress. Um, I'm not gonna go into the detail. You've had books recommended to you, I'm going to recommend a book. It's called Courting Disaster by Mark Thiessen, um, T-H-I-E-S-S-E-N, for those of you who are taking notes. And um, it details the results of these interrogations and the use of these techniques and why they were entirely lawful. So far as Abu Ghraib and, and um, uh, Guantanamo being used to recruit 
terrorists, um, ask yourself this question. Um, what would it take to get you to go out and commit mass murder? If you heard of some outrage against an, Amer an American, would you go out and commit mass murder? Of course you wouldn't. Recruiting of terrorists takes place with two elements. One has to do with an aspect of a religion as practiced in several parts of the Muslim world. That's a problem for us. That's a problem for them. But that is the principal cause of recruiting people to commit acts of terrorism. The second is success. One is a doctrine. The second is success. Those are the principal elements in recruiting terrorists. If you were to go and tell every potential terrorist that we've closed Guantanamo, not one of them would stop to use something else. So far as Guantanamo itself is concerned, I was there in February of 2008. It has three advantages over any prison in the United States. It is remote, secure, and humane. I had occasion to see uh, on closed circuit television the high value detainees other than Khalid Sheikh Mohammed who was out with a, uh, with a delegation that was visiting from the, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross so that he could complain about his, his treatment. I did, however, visit his cell. Um, it featured not only a cell, uh, but an adjoining exercise room um, that had a, um, an elliptical machine that was the same make and model as the one that I used at the Landsberg Apartments where I then lived in Washington, except, of course, he didn't have to get up at 5 a.m. Um, to be the first one on the machine. Um, so the notion that somehow it is a national disgrace is ridiculous. Um, the, um, the use of interrogation techniques stopped in the t ones that I mentioned, stopped in 2003. That was the last time anybody was interrogated using those techniques. And it was simply because there was nobody who was valuable enough to warrant that kind of treatment. But we got an enormous amount of intelligence thanks to them. What we do now, now that we've given up any classified interrogation program, is to kill people with drones. Um, you can't get any intelligence out of a dead body. And the most valuable use of any detainee is as a source of intelligence. Once you've solved the crime and gotten the defendant, the most valuable thing to do is to interrogate that defendant until you've gotten the intelligence necessary. And there would be nothing to stop treating terrorists who perpetrate acts like uh, San Bernardino, of course they were killed, um, or Boston, or um, any of the others from being treated initially as unlawful combatants, interrogated, and then turned over to the civilian authorities. We don't do that. And we've suffered as a result. Having said all of that and gotten it off my chest, um, I want to tell you that it is both an honor and a pleasure to be here um, when you stop and consider that this is quite an amazing uh, gathering. Um, it includes representatives of the two countries in the world who are the main targets of the terrorism that's loose in the world today. And we've gotten together um, not to talk about um, techniques for combat or how to, even how to gather intelligence uh, or really any other technique that involves, that can be brought to bear against our enemies, but rather to discuss how we do whatever we do in that, in that, in that department consistent with the law. And it's a tribute to the two countries, each, each in its own way, to be obsessed with law um, even as it goes about trying to wage what is in fact a life and death struggle. Obviously that struggle is far more immediate and apparent in Israel. Um, after all, you live in the neighborhood. And so it seems, at least to me, that it is kind of a, a paradox that in Israel um, the use of force in the struggle against terrorists is actually far more constrained by courts than it is in the United States. Not only um, are legal considerations at the forefront whenever and wherever Israeli forces engage their enemies, but also, as we've seen and heard, Israeli courts intervene directly in combat decisions while combat is going on. And the rules of standing that prevent filing of many lawsuits in the United States do not even exist in Israel. And ripeness and justiciability, you've heard, they don't, they don't recognize those doctrines. And they, there is no word in Hebrew, as we heard, <laughs> for uh, deference. Um, and so organizations with a particular interest 
or point of view, self-proclaimed human rights organizations can and do litigate um, issues having to do with, um, without, without even having to go to the trouble of, of getting an individual plaintiff who is directly affected by the behavior that they want to, that they want to challenge. Um, indeed, I would say that procedurally, at least, uh, conditions are Israel, in Israel are far more hospitable to those who believe that courts uh, can and, when necessary, should participate uh, directly in um, targeting and other decisions uh, in active combat situations. By contrast, in the United States, even matters relating to uh, detention uh, far from the field of battle um, are approached only hesitantly uh, by the courts. Again, uh, there is an English word for deference, it's deference. Um, although some cases um, have ended with the Supreme Court uh, having a role in, and other courts having a role in detention decisions, at least those distant from the battlefield, the usual rule is that in decisions relating uh, not only to active combat, but even to detention that might affect combat, courts in the United States usually defer to judgments of the politically responsible branches, the executive and the legislative. To some extent, of course, uh, that's the result um, both of our constitutional structure um, and also the general unfamiliarity um, of civilian courts with military matters. Um, to, put, to put it simply, um, we don't have universal military service in this country, and so military expertise is not part of a lot of judges' experience. And that's not to say that there aren't those who believe that in the United States things should be otherwise. One law school professor and former dean has just published a book in which he traces what he regards as government infringement of a broad range of constitutional rights to what he regards as the Supreme Court's undue deference to the political branches, mainly the executive and the refusal of courts uh, in general to exercise what he regards as their proper role. He condemns not only the Supreme Court, but also the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the FISA Court, he criticizes that court not only for the outcomes um, it produces by giving the government what he feels is free reign to conduct electronic surveillance, uh, but also for reaching results, at least in part, uh, uh, in decisions that are themselves not disclosed, uh, thus creating a body of secret law. Um, the criticisms of our counterintelligence efforts um, fall mainly in, uh, deal mainly with three topics. Secrecy, detention together with uh, the closely related topic of interrogation, and surveillance, mainly but not exclusively electronic surveillance. It's a regular feature of panels and seminars um, on the government's response to Islamist terrorism in this country, at least in the, that is in, in this country, uh, that what we must do is to strike a proper balance between safety and the liberties uh, protected by the Constitution, and of course, that studying the Constitution itself uh, is essential to doing that. Now, actually, I happen to believe that the Constitution has very little to do with these disputes, uh, that we're faced here with a political and a national security problem that's been constitutionalized in certain of its aspects, in part to avoid dealing with it. Um, and in the process, we trivialize the real Constitution, and that at some point, I think we're going to have to pull up our socks and deal with the problem, or else it's going to deal harshly with us. I think part of taking the Constitution seriously involves recognizing the choices that it does not make for us and that we need to make for ourselves. I think the failure to do that um, accounts for why, despite the supposedly deferential uh, posture that courts take, um, the fact is that courts and um, the population generally um, in the United States are more wound around the axle um, about national security decisions than courts and the public in Israel. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of um, um, discussing uh, the criticisms launched in the book, principally, although this is, I really recognize an audience that includes um, people from um, uh, not, only, not only Americans, but people of Israeli background. Uh, but the point is, I think they illustrate why, despite the, more, the far more intrusive role that courts play in Israel, Israel deals with its terrorism problem much more directly and with less angst than the United States. The, critici the criticisms mentioned start with secrecy. The need for secrecy in pursuing the ends of government was actually something that was well known 
um, at the time the Constitution was written um, and by those who first declared our independence. The first Constitutional Congress convened under rules that required that the doors be shut during the transaction of business um, and that the members keep their deliberations secret until authorized to make disclosure. The second Constitutional Congress imposed an oath of secrecy on each member to be released only when Congress voted by a majority vote to release it. The Constitution itself was drafted under conditions of strict secrecy. Uh, in summertime Philadelphia, obviously before air conditioning, uh, the windows and doors were kept shut. Uh, James Madison, the principal architect of the Constitution, although he was a proponent of open government, freely conceded that no Constitution would ever have been adopted by the Convention um, if the debate had been public. The body of the Constitution itself explicitly accommodates the need for secrecy. It provides that each House of Congress, this is from the Constitution, shall keep a journal of its proceedings and from time to time publish the same, accepting such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy. The Constitution, of course, built into the government um, a system of checks and balances when branches of the federal, not only be, between branches of the federal government, between the federal government and the states, uh, but it provided little in the way of a mechanism other than the power of the purse for Congress to oversee and check the power of the executive, requiring only that the president report to Congress from time to time on the State of the Union. And here I think it's important to recall that the, the reason for the creation of the FISA court um, to oversee collection of intelligence um, was simply to provide yet another layer of supervision. Um, in addition to supervision from the executive, supervision by the intelligence committees of Congress, it added supervision by the, by, by the judiciary, kind of a, a Madisonian trifecta. Um, but it was not to open intelligence gathering to, the pub to public scrutiny or to turn it into an adversary proceeding. It was simply to assure that there was one more layer um, of, of, of review to assure that Fourth Amendment rights were protected. Um, all people present in the United States and American citizens residing abroad um, are protected by the Fourth Amendment, and that was the only purpose of adding that layer. Um, the creation of the FISA court was certainly not constitutionally mandated. The only court act that's actually constitutionally mandated is the Supreme Court. And the Constitution says, and such other inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. However, the very existence of the FISA court uh, has led to demands that its deliberations be conducted under adversary conditions, um, which is suggested as the main attribute of a real court uh, and opened up to public scrutiny. Uh, critics of the FISA court uh, are fond of pointing out, as you heard this morning, that uh, the government has prevailed in 90 some odd percent of its applications to that court. Now what they overlook, in addition to what Secretary Chertoff pointed out, which is that uh, the, the government is extraordinarily conservative um, in its applications to the court because it understands very well that credibility is its principal stock and trade, but that these applications themselves sometimes proceed on an iterative basis. That is, you submit the application, the court pushes back, the government goes back to the drawing board, makes adjustments, and resubmits the application. So there is a kind of conversation between the court and the government. Um, because the 1978 statute uh, gave the judiciary a role in supervising the, the gathering of intelligence um, and did it through the creation of a court, um, some have used um, the existence of a court uh, to demand that supervision be provided through an adversary process. Um, you heard this morning from Secretary Chertoff that the, that, that has been rejected um, as impracticable and unnecessary. Um, in fact, the judges of the court themselves have said they think it's unnecessary. It would also create um, a kind of um, constitutional anomaly in which you would have one branch of the executive litigating against another, um, an oddity that um, I think simply points up um, the absurdity of the suggestion. Um, in the same way, obviously, opening the work of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to public scrutiny would negate the whole purpose of gathering intelligence, which is to maintain secrecy. Detention and interrogation of suspected and confirmed terrorists have also generated what purport to be constitutional controversies. Uh, so we're told that it's a violation of the Constitution 
uh, to detain anyone without a trial. And that interrogation as well presents constitutional concerns uh, in the means that are used to get the information and the possibly incriminating effect of any information that's disclosed. In fact, there is a whole range of situations, some relating to war and some not, in which detention without trial is entirely permissible so that the person or people do not harm others or themselves. In each of the wars we have fought, we've detained at times hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war, some in the United States, some elsewhere. None of them, other than those charged with war crimes, which were very few, none of them were tried simply for having fought us. In fact, none of them were permitted even to file a habeas corpus petition. The Constitution itself, as you know, provides for the suspension of habeas corpus when Congress thinks it necessary. Our criminal laws provide, when necessary, for pretrial detention of those who may be charged with crimes but not yet convicted, when that's necessary to protect public safety or to assure that they show up for trial. And detention of, even of material witnesses who have committed no crime uh, but who stand charged but who, but who have valuable information is permitted in order to make sure that their testimony is available when needed if they present a risk of flight. Aliens who face deportation may be detained, and the mentally ill may be detained to protect society and themselves. Pregnant female addicts may be detained to protect their unborn children. Sex offenders, even after their terms have expired, may be detained if they present a risk of recidivating. All of those detentions occur without offense to the Constitution. Many of these authorities predate the Constitution itself. Um, it isn't that we started with um, an absolute ban on detention and worked down from there. Um, some of them have expanded, uh, notably detention of sex offenders. Others have narrowed, notably detention of the mentally ill. But they've existed without successful constitutional challenge. As to unlawful combatants, those who do not follow the rules of war that were put there to protect citizens, um, as to them, it was permissible at one time to deny them any legal protection, whatever. The laws of war offer combatants essentially the following bargain. If you wear a uniform so that you can be distinguished from civilians, if you carry your arms openly, if you follow a, recognizable, a recognized chain of command so that you, can be, uh, fo you follow orders and you, your superiors can be held responsible for what you do, and most importantly, if you don't target civilians, then you're assured that if you're captured, you must be treated humanely, consistent with your rank, you may not be forced to disclose the secrets of your side, and you may be detained without trial for the duration of the conflict. As I said, at one time, if a combatant did not adhere to those standards, he received no protection at all. It was permissible to treat him, um, as it's put in an international law treatise that I have on my shelf in the office, summarily, which is a euphemism for shoot him. In fact, there were Germans who were tried after World War II for summarily executing partisans who were acquitted because that was not a violation of international law. It was not a war crime because partisans did not fight in uniform um, and did not carry their arms openly. Current law still permits US citizens who violate the laws of war to be treated just the same as non-citizens on what seems to me to be the entirely plausible theory that if they throw in their lot with unlawful enemies, they can be treated as unlawful enemies. However, the distinction between lawful and unlawful combatants appears to be wearing down to the point where some have suggested although, that although those who follow all the rules, uh, all the laws of, rules of the laws of war, uh, without, may be detained without trial for the duration of the conflict, we should actually offer a better deal to those who violate all the rules. Rather than being held indefinitely, or at least until it's clear that they no longer present a danger, um, they have the right to be tried in a civilian court with appointed counsel, the presumption of innocence, and the possibility that if acquitted uh, of the crime with which they, they're charged, they might be released. Um, in fact, one terrorist, um, a man involved in the planning of um, the uh, attacks on our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, nearly did just that. Ahmed Gailani uh, was acquitted after a trial in New York of the hundreds of murders that resulted uh, from those bombings, but he was convicted of one count of conspiracy to damage U.S. property, for which 
despite the innocuous sounding charge, he was sentenced to life in prison. Before he was tried, Gailani had been detained at Guantanamo, and although he had been charged before he was captured and detained there, um, his case was apparently supposed to be the thin end of the wedge to show that we can bring people from Guantanamo to the mainland and try them without adverse consequences. Um, his near total acquittal in New York uh, took some of the steam out of that gambit. We have captured and detained many people who in fact violated the laws of war, uh, some of whom have evidence um, against, uh, um, uh, some of whom we, we have evidence against, I should say, that's sufficient to charge them with war crimes, uh, and others of whom we don't have evidence against sufficient to charge them with war crimes, uh, but who are nonetheless um, enough of a threat to our security that simply releasing them would ensure that they return to the battle um, and cause more casualties than they've caused already, even assuming that some jurisdiction will have them. Um, all of those detainees um, have intelligence that's of value um, to us, um, not only about particular plots, but about relationships between and among terrorist groups and even indivi between individual terrorists that can be used to dismantle those groups and to capture people who mean us harm. The Supreme Court has ruled that even uh, detainees not charged may continue to be held. However, the current administration is unwilling to rely simply on the laws of, on laws of war detention, um, with the result that um, interrogation of newly captured detainees, when there are such detainees, is truncated, and they're either turned over to other countries uh, or charged in civilian courts. Uh, for example, when a defendant involved in the attack on our embassy in Benghazi, uh, Ahmad Abu Qatala, uh, was caught in Libya, um, he was held for 19 days aboard a Navy vessel. Uh, he was interrogated in an effort to get intelligence from him, uh, whatever intelligence he may have had. Now, I've got no idea whether the government got anything of value from him, but 19 days is a ludicrously short time in which to get useful information from even a willing subject particularly when you've already told that willing subject that the limit of what he can be subjected to is the Army Field Manual, which is used, by the way, as a training manual by terrorist groups around the country. It's available on the Internet. Um, intelligence gathering from human sources is usually an incremental process in which information is gathered, checked, new information is gotten, and then questioners return to a detainee, sometimes over a period of months, to obtain additional information. Um, in any event, at the end of 19 days, Abu Qatala was brought before a court, formally charged, assigned a lawyer. That ended his use uh, as an intelligence source. Um, what we now have is some detainees held at Guantanamo without charges, some held with charges that are pending before a military commission, and still others held in prisons who have been convicted of crimes or who have been, are awaiting civilian trials. Um, this patchwork of detention um, is not constitutionally mandated. This outcome is the result of a series of political accommodations. Although I'm describing this situation in present terms, I certainly don't intend uh, to absolve the administration in which I served from responsibility, if appropriate, for blame. At the time that we first responded militarily after the attack on September 11, 2001, it appears that great reliance was placed on World War II vintage authorities um, in determining how detainees would be treated. Recall that even prisoners of war who followed the rules of war were held indefinitely and without recourse to the courts. And when two groups of German saboteurs were, landed on mainland United States, uh, one group on Long Island and one in Florida, um, and fatally for them, took off their uniforms, uh, they were rounded up um, and on the direct orders of President Roosevelt, they were tried before a military commission in Washington, even though the civilian courts were open and functioning. They were convicted and executed all within three months of the day that they landed. The claim of at least one of them, that he was a U.S. citizen, um, was rejected as irrelevant. Their convictions were affirmed uh, in an opinion that was issued after they were already dead the court having issued an order saying that they were going to affirm the convictions so as to allow the executions to proceed. Now, it was anticipated, based in part on that history, that the executive would set up military commissions to deal with detainees um, who would be charged with violating the laws of war, others would be held indefinitely, and it would be no big problem. 
However, as detentions lengthened, the Supreme Court has pared back that history mightily. It held first that the President did not have the authority to establish the military commissions on his own, a gap that Congress quickly filled with the Military Commissions Act. And then the court held that even unlawful combatants uh, detained by the United States in a location that's outside the theater of war have a right at least to challenge the lawfulness of their detention in a proceeding that resembles uh, the rudimentary challenge that's brought in a habeas corpus case. Um, habeas corpus, of course, is a right that actually predate, predated the Constitution and which the Constitution recognizes uh, when it permits um, its suspension only uh, by act of Congress. Uh, however, the Constitution does not provide substantive standards that describe what context, ha conduct has to be proved in order to detain someone in a habeas corpus proceeding uh, as an unlawful combatant and what level and type of proof um, is necessary to ratify continuing to hold a prisoner as an unlawful combatant and for how long. Interrogation techniques used on some detainees have been objected to on constitutional grounds, although constitutional objections really have been secondary to the claim that the techniques violated the statutory ban on torture, uh, which has, for reasons I described before, they didn't. Um, nothing in any clause of the Constitution provides a clue as to what's permitted and what is not permitted when there's reason to believe that a detainee has information which, if disclosed, can save lives. The Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment has no application here because interrogation techniques are not applied as punishment, but rather as coercion to get people to disclose information. The only hint of a constitutional standard comes from a line of due process cases that started with Rochin versus California and, has the, and bans the government from doing anything to a prisoner that might, quote, shock the conscience, unquote. That's not what I would call a rigorous standard. Um, considering not only the range of sensibilities that lie under the thousand or so black robes of federal judges and the thousands more uh, that populate the state courts, and also the range of situations that confront law enforcement officers, um, it's impossible to glean from that a reasonable standard. Pumping the stomach of a prisoner may shock the conscience when it's done to derive evidence of a drug offense, which is what happened in the Rochin case. But later cases have made it clear that the standard is situational. That is, what shocks the conscience in one situation doesn't necessarily shock the conscience in another. One thing the Constitution does do is to provide a response to those who argue that we should have a direct voice um, in the interrogation techniques that are applied, as the people who hold this point of view say, in our name. Um, the answer is that all the Constitution, what the Constitution establishes is a representative democracy, not a direct democracy. Decisions are made by those who hold executive or legislative office, and those are reviewable, if at all, at election time. After Watergate, um, it was felt, uh, I'm sorry, um, until the creation of the FISA court, it appeared that there was enough protection in the Fourth Amendment's general command that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches shall not be violated. Um, and in the warrant clause of that amendment, which provides that no warrant could issue except upon probable cause, um, that, that um, there was enough protection there um, to protect the rights of those Americans who are um, of residents of the United States, uh, both uh, citizens and non-citizens, and Americans traveling abroad. After Watergate, it was felt necessary to subject even intelligence gathering uh, to supervision um, uh, only, um, not only by the executive itself in Congress, but also by a court. Uh, the need for that assurance uh, appears to have stemmed from a few lines um, in the White House tapes in which the President is heard urging that the Watergate break-in be called um, a national security um, operation, um, and another where he suggested that if the President does something, it is automatically lawful. Um, I'm going to skip past uh, the discussion of um, the, uh, uh, the metadata program about which you heard uh, already um, and um, say that there is now a foot uh, to curtail the gathering of information even from non-citizens of the United States overseas 
uh, people who have no rights under the Constitution by treating them as if they were protected by the Fourth Amendment. In essence, this turns the Constitution into a treaty with the entire world. Um, the wording of the Fourth Amendment itself provides no clue as to what precautions may be necessary um, or which would be unduly burdensome in order to protect the rights that are guaranteed in it. Now, all of this would be largely of academic interest, if not for the fact that whether we acknowledge it or not, um, the United States has been, for decades, um, the target of a war being waged by a death cult. Uh, it didn't start with 9-11, didn't even start in February 1993 with what we now call the First World Trade Center bombing. Uh, you may be interested to learn that, in fact, it started back in the 1940s uh, when one of the leading lights of the Muslim Brotherhood, a man named Syed Qutb, who was then an Egyptian working in the education ministry in Cairo, uh, was awarded a traveling fellowship that was designed in principal part to get him out of the country. Um, he um, chose to travel uh, to the United States, um, and in particular uh, to Greeley, Colorado. Now, when he encountered Western society in post-war Greeley, Colorado, uh, with jazz music, crew cuts, and dancing, um, he's reputed to have walked in on a church social where people were dancing to Baby It's Cold Outside, um, he was scandalized. Um, he decided that Islam as he knew it would have to be eternally at war with a society like that. He went back to Egypt. He continued to agitate in the fashion that in the late 1940s had gotten him a traveling fellowship, except in the late 1960s it got him hanged. Uh, many of his followers uh, left Egypt for Saudi Arabia, including his brother, uh, Qutb's brother, who wound up teaching the spoiled son of a wealthy Saudi construction family, a young man named Osama bin Laden. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, now, to fight this ideology, um, it's going to take not only force, although it's certainly going to take that, uh, it's also going to take support for those in the Muslim world who favor reform, and they are there. Uh, in 2014, uh, President Sisi of Egypt deliver, uh, delivered a remarkable speech at Al-Azhar University in Cairo. You remember, that's the speech where, that's the, the university where President Obama delivered his outreach talk in 2009. That is the seat of Sunni learning. Um, President Sisi addressed the Imam of Al-Azhar University, looked right at him, and the other Imams who were in the audience, and told them that Islam, as then being preached and practiced, was bringing about the destruction of Muslims. And he urged them to put an end to it, and urged that curricula in Egypt uh, be changed so as to eliminate the, te the teaching of strict Islam, um, the teaching that it has to be imposed by force if necessary, um, and that it's the personal duty of each Muslim to do that. The Imam, Ahmed al Tayyab followed up with his own speech, which he delivered not in Egypt, uh, not in Chevy Chase, uh, but in Saudi Arabia, arguing that Muslim young people were being misled uh, and ruined by an erroneous interpretation of Islam. Although at latest word, he may have regressed somewhat from that position. The fact is that Egypt remains committed to reforming curricula, uh, and I doubt that anybody here has heard of that. There are those in our own country who preach the same message, but they are not the focus of the government's outreach, which has gone instead to organizations like CARE, the Conference on American Islamic Relations, and ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America, both of which are affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood sounds like a fraternal organization, the Elks or the Rotary. It's not. The slogan of the Muslim Brotherhood from the time of its founding until now is and has been, Allah is our objective, the Prophet is our leader, the Quran is our law, Jihad is our way, and dying in the path of Allah is our highest hope. Care, as a matter of fact, was named as an unindicted co-conspirator in a, the largest terrorism financing case in the history of this country. Um, they are the people who are regularly invited to the White House and are recognized as representatives of Muslims in the United States. As recently as last week, the Secretary of Homeland Security attended and spoke at the annual meeting of ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America, and thereby credentialed again that organization. He waved off any criticism of what he was saying as merely reaching out to an audience of Muslims. His blindness to the secondary effect of that outreach is stunning. Imagine what the reaction is bound to be 
for the average Muslim resident of the United States when high government officials confer on ISNA the mantle of respectability that comes with being wooed by such officials? How likely do you think it is that such an average resident would reject the counsel of CARE and ISNA and opt instead for the teaching of those believe, who believe that those organizations are intent on subverting the values of this country? How likely do you think it is? Not very likely at all. And no doubt the claim would be made that if our government favored reform-minded Muslim groups and enhanced their credentials and engaged them rather than organizations like CARE and ISNA, the government would be picking winners and losers in a religious dispute and thereby violating the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. The point here, however, is not a matter of religion. It's a matter of politics and national security. Is it lawful for the government to favor, not for religious, but for political and national security reasons, people who accept our constitutional system of governance and to oppose those who don't? It was entirely permissible to do that during the Cold War when our adversaries were communists who wanted to subvert our constitutional system and replace it with a totalitarian system. In fighting the war against such an enemy, one that thinks that not only dancing, but the very idea that people can choose their own government is a sacrilege. Perhaps the United States should follow the example and take the advice of our greatest president, certainly our greatest lawyer president, who said this about how to deal with an unprecedented crisis that threatened the existence of the country at that time. He said, as our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Make no mistake about it. The ideology that motivates Muslims who are at war with the United States is a totalitarian ideology. It governs every aspect of life, economics, family law, the works. It transcends allegiance to any nation state. Does this ideology's use of religious symbols, its call to a god and to a prophet, its reliance on a book, does that mean that even to the extent that it trenches on politics and seeks to impose obligations on non-Muslims, and even to the extent it endangers our national security uh, by encouraging Muslims to commit violence, do the hallmarks of religion mean that we can't fight it the same way that we fought other forms of totalitarianism? Do the free exercise and establishment clauses of the First Amendment tie our hands and prevent us from doing that simply because the, ide the ideology can claim to be rooted in a religion? Israel appears to be troubled by no such concerns, perhaps as the result of living, of living in close proximity to its enemies. Israel is not constrained by abstract and theoretical concerns. Its intelligence professionals analyze the words and motives of its enemies and act on that analysis. Can the United States do the same and oppose the agenda of its enemies to the extent that that agenda involves uh, political and national security concerns that we find unacceptable? Did it when our opponent was, it, can we do it uh, the same way that we did uh, when our opponent was communism? Now the answer to that hasn't yet been written, at least not in a case or in a series of cases. And no doubt there will be cases uh, if we try, just as there have been cases about intelligence gathering under the Fourth Amendment and cases about interrogation under the Fifth. But if we in the United States take our Constitution seriously, not just one or two of its amendments, but the political architecture that it put in place for a government that can and must protect the state and protect its citizens. If we take that constitution seriously, maybe we can fight the ideology that I've described in the way that I've suggested in order to save the country that the president I referred to just a minute ago, the country that he called, and it's truer today than it was when he said it in 1862, the last best hope of earth. I think it's worth at least a try. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your views with us. Uh, Kevin Meister from Human Rights First, but uh, I'll ask this on a personal capacity. Sorry? Oh, I, I'm from Human Rights First, but I'll ask this on a personal capacity. 
since you argue that waterboarding or being placed in a coffin-sized box for over 24 being hours... Being placed in a coffin-sized box was not a part of any interrogation technique, but go um, ahead. Okay. If, if waterboarding is not torture, do you, do you, are you implying that foreign governments could lawfully use that uh, as an interrogation technique? And to put it in to more graphic, let's say Syrian government, which considers all rebels to be terrorists, captures an American soldier arming a rebel, which it considers to be a terrorist entity, uh, could that the Syrian government lawfully waterboard an American soldier? Syri the Syrian government doesn't act on the basis of my say-so or the say-so of anybody else. The Syrian government kills children, um, tortures adults and children, and the notion that somehow if we waterboard people, it'll let them waterboard them also is ridiculous. That's the response to your question. It doesn't, it doesn't influence the actions of somebody like, um, of people who are involved in, 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 in the government, of, in governing Syria, to the extent it's being governed. Pardon? What evidence do you, as Ron Campius from the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, what evidence do you have that ISNA, an organization that works closely with the ADL on uh, anti-discrimination activities, is currently, currently, uh, reflecting the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, or of Sa'id Qutb in the, uh, his, his rantings in the 1940s? I, I'm not, I don't think I understand the question. You talked about, you, you delivered a, a speech in which you connected the, uh, uh, the work of care and ISNA and Jed Johnson's address to ISNA to the Muslim Brotherhood. Correct. It's true that there is a, some sort of peripheral association at the founding of ISNA, but that there's no current connection. How do you, how, how do you tie ISNA into the Muslim Brotherhood ideolo ideology? ISNA is just as much an affiliate of the Muslim Brotherhood as care. What, what's the evidence for that? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have the, I don't have the, 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 the folio here. Yes, hi, Remina. Yes, hi, Remina Kimi. Uh, I just had a quick question uh, regarding Abu Zubaydah. Yes. Uh, there's a man by the name of Ali Sufan, which I probably you probably know. He's a f uh, Ali Sufan who's an F uh, FBI. I know about special, Ali Sufan, special agent, and he spoke right. about uh, how they waterboarded 83 times Abu Zubaydah, and it basically they got nothing from him, and he sat down with Abu yeah. Zubaydah, gave him some coffee yeah. and cookies, and right. I, he started I know, to speak. I know, but, but so I just. Did, Right. All right. Let me just yeah. finish. The, just, um, we, let me just well, regarding <coughs> this idea. Ali Sufan is a liar. Ali Sufan wasn't there at the time of the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah. He has been making um, a fortune on on that on that fiction. And by the way, if you read um, the book that I mentioned, uh, Courting Disaster, uh, you'll find several pages lovingly de devoted to Ali Sufan. Yeah, according to Ali Sufan, he, 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 he did some sort of Starsky and Hutch interrogation of, of, uh, of Abu Zubaydah and got information. Hi, my name is John Bauman. I'm unaffiliated. Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> I may be the I only wish, safe I wish place. I could say the same. Right. Several things. So to the issue of torture, I guess what occurred is a question of fact. I will leave that to be decided by others. Uh, but you spent a lot of time talking about how much information was obtained as a result of those techniques. It seems to me... From three people. It seems to me that that is irrelevant. If it was torture, it was torture, and it seems it's illegal. Uh, and if it wasn't torture, then what's the point in discussing... Yeah, what we obtained okay, I, from it. I take your point. But that's meant as, a, as an implicit response to people who say torture doesn't work. Um, my, 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 uh, my other it, question... It wasn't, it wasn't, it, the point is it wasn't used to get particular pieces of information. It just didn't it seem used, relevant to whether or not we were torturing people. No, it was, it was, used, it was used to put people in a cooperative frame of mind, and they were then, and they were then interrogated. If they lied, then the, then the process began again. So Go ahead. I'm, I'm not uh, a very religious person. I'm not well-educated in religion. But 
you made several references to uh, Muslims' belief in the Quran as the law of the land. Um, and I'm trying to understand the difference between that and the Jewish belief in Talmud and Torah. Uh, and do we think that Jews are uh, ineligible for citizenship here because what? they believe well because they believe in Talmud and Torah as the law. Number one, I didn't say anything about it being ineligible for citizenship. Number two, um, as far as I know, um, no Jew says the Torah demands that he go out and kill people so as to impose his religion on anybody else. And I don't think that um, we're talking about eligibility for citizenship. We're talking about monitoring people um, so as to prevent attacks. Of course not. And I'm trying to understand the difference between the concept of believing in the Quran and the concept of believing in Talmud and Torah. There's no difference in the concept. The question is what, is what those things command you to do and what part they play in your life. I know the question was to, to Judge Mukasey, John, but I've been to Israel, and I'm going to stick my nose into this conversation about 40 plus times on behalf of Hebrew University. And I don't know of any ultra-Orthodox Jews there, the Haredi, who walked onto buses uh, with bombs attached to them and blew up Palestinians in East Jerusalem. Uh, huh? Yes, he climbed up. Yeah, there are exceptions, but the... You found one and there are sick, there are sick... You found one, okay, you found one example. I'm talking about a systematic. I've been there when the bombs have gone off. I've been there when the buses were blown up. Notably, okay. Baruch Goldstein was not, did not have a, a public square named after him. I'm not saying that, but it's systematic. We're it's systemic, about something that is in, systemic in Israel and characteristic of a society, yes. and it isn't. Yes. 